when the Buddha taught breath meditation to his son, he started out by saying, make your mind like earth. People say discussing things to your mind, or you pick up what they say. Think of the earth. People throw disgusting things on earth and it doesn't react. People throw nice things on the earth and it doesn't react. You want to develop that same quality of mind, not only with regard to what other people do or say, but also to what's going on in your meditation, so that you can see things clearly, not immediately run with your first reaction. That's an important point, because the instructions don't stop there. In fact, when the Buddha gets into the different steps for breath meditation, he, gets, he has you get quite proactive. Try to breathe in a way where there's a sense of well-being in the body. You don't just breathe any old which way, or accept the breath as it is. You ask yourself, what way of breathing would feel good, would give rise to a sense of refreshment inside? What kind of breathing would give rise to a sense of ease or pleasure? What kind of breathing would help gladden the mind when it's down, steady the mind when it's erratic, release the mind from unskillful states? You don't learn these things just by sitting there watching. You experiment. This is how we learn about anything in the world. If we just sat there and watched and didn't have any role in the world, we wouldn't know anything about it. <clears throat> things would come and go, and well, we would notice that they were coming and going, but we wouldn't know why. We couldn't steer them in a direction where we wanted them to go. It's because we can interfere. We can play around with things. That was Kurt Vonnegut's image of science. scientists, is that they were little kids playing. And there's that aspect of science. You play around. You say, what about this? What about that? Maybe this is connected to that. Well, how do you know? Well, you test it. And it's the same with the mind, the same with the breath. You have to test things. So then you can use the breath and use your mind for what you want it. After all, we're trying to create a path here that goes someplace. I was reading today someone saying that as long as you have no goals, you're not trying to get anywhere, then nothing can get in your way, which logically is true. But it certainly doesn't help you when you're sitting in the midst of an un unpleasant emotion, something that's disturbing. We're trying to get out of these things. After all, the Buddha said, we're trying to escape from unskillful, unskillful habits, unskillful mind states, that the mind states that create suffering. That's what the Four Noble Truths are all about, is to figure out which mind states are causing the suffering and how to put an end to them. And you can do that only by experimenting. So when something comes up, you're sitting here with a breath and all of a sudden an unpleasant emotion comes up. The first thing you do is figure out how to breathe so that the emotion doesn't really get into your body. And this too is one of the steps in breath meditation. The Buddha calls it calming bodily fabrication, i.e. calming the way you breathe. He also talks about calming mental fabrication. Looking at the feelings you have, and feelings here doesn't mean emotions, it means feeling tones of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. And your perceptions, the images that are running around in your mind, giving rise to greed, anger, delusion, fear, panic, whatever. You want to see what perceptions are operating there in the background. One of the ways you do that is try to change the perception, bring a new perception into the mind. and that's less likely to stir, stir up those emotions. And then you can ask yourself, okay, what in the mind resists this? What in the mind feels that this new image is artificial? Often we have the feeling that, well, whatever comes up in the mind is natural. What it is is the result of your old karma. It's an old habit. And the whole point of the practice is we're going to learn new habits. As the Buddha said, if we couldn't change our habits, change from unskillful to skillful habits, you wouldn't have bothered to teach. And 
And we can do that because of this pro process of what's called fabrication. The Pali word is sankara. It doesn't mean lies. It means the fact that you are shaping your experience. Some of your present experience comes from the input of past karma, like the raw materials. And then you shape it. And if you didn't shape it, you wouldn't have an experience of the present moment at all. It's because we're shaping things with bodily fabrication, the way we breathe, what the Buddha calls verbal fabrication, the way we talk to ourselves, and the mental fabrication, images and feelings. These are things we can change. It's because we have these forms of fabrication. This is how we take the raw materials and turn them into our experience of the present moment. So when anything unpleasant comes up, you can ask yourself, well, what's the past potential that I'm feeding on right here, and how am I fixing it? It's like putting a dish of food on your table. You take one taste, and it's miserable. And you have to ask yourself, okay, what was the problem? Was, were the ingredients bad, or was it the way I fixed them? We go back and you fix something new. Try to choose better ingredients. Like when you're trying to get the breath comfortable. Don't focus on the pains in the body. Focus on the parts of the body that seem okay. Those can provide a raw material for a place for the mind to settle down. There is that choice here in the present moment. If there were nothing but pain everywhere in the body, you'd die. There's got to be something pleasant some part of the body, so focus on that. And there's a part of the mind as well that's more still than other parts of the mind, that's not playing along, say, with the panic or the, or the lust or the anger, the part that's watching. Try to locate that. Settle in there. That's like getting better ingredients for your food. Then ask yourself, how am I fixing this? And here we just learn through Trial and error. What kind of breathing feels good right now? We'll try longer breathing, shorter breathing. What kind of breathing will help maintain that sense of okay in the body and allow it to deepen so it becomes more and more pleasant, more and more like the sort of place you really would want to, to stay in. And you get a sensation that would feel good to bathe the body in and let it spread all around. It's like learning new ways of fixing your food. So when you've got better ingredients and you've got better, better techniques, you employ them. You don't just sit there and watch whatever gets thrown up on your table. You go back to the kitchen and you fix it well. The only times when you sit and watch what's going on without doing anything is when you can't figure out what's going wrong. So you try to look at that part of the mind that is not reacting, the part that's more like Earth. So I'm going to stay here and just watch this for a while until you can detect what you've been doing wrong. How will you detect it? Well, there'll be little impulses in the mind to go in a certain direction and think certain things. And when you can catch them, you realize, oh, it's because I was thinking in this way, or I was holding on to this image in the mind. That's why I was worked up. And then you take that knowledge and you use it. You put it to use. It's in this way that the meditation becomes a skill. The Buddhist word, vijja. It's the opposite of avicca. Avicca is ignorance. But avicca also means lack of skill. That's one of the causes for suffering. So as we develop more and more skill in how we approach the present moment, we find that we're going to suffer less and less. A very direct lesson in the Four Noble Truths. They're not abstract truths. They're truths to be used right now. Focus your attention. If you're suffering, well, what is the suffering? And what's the cause? 
what arises together with the suffering, or what falls away when the suffering falls away. That's something you can watch right here, right now. And you can see it more and more clearly as you develop the path. So all this falls into those Four Noble Truths that we were chanting about just now. They sound abstract, but they're not. They're right here. And the more skill you bring to them, the more you find that suffering really does fall away. The burdens on the mind fall away. And when the burdens on the mind fall away, it's good not only for you, but also for the people around you. It's in this way that the meditation is good for you and for others. It's a gift to yourself and a gift to others. Because when you're less burdened by your own suffering, you're in a better position, one, not to be leaning on other people, and two, actually have the strength to help them shoulder some of their burdens as well. So remember, you're starting out with a mind like Earth, but you don't just stay there. Use that as a foundation for the path to something really good in life.